In 1964, Stephen H. Dole and Isaac Asimov got together and wrote a cute little book entitled, Planets for Man. Chapter 8 An Appreciation of the Earth For all the pictures of far travel and of strange worlds beyond the sky that we have been presenting in this book it is still on the Earth that we live at present. Surely however the vision of the lands beyond will help us look at the earth with new eyes and with new appreciation. We take our home for granted most of the time. We complain about the weather ignore the splendor of our sunsets the scenery and the natural beauties of the lands and seas around us. We cease to be impressed by the enormous diversity of living species that the earth supports. This is natural of course since we know only the earth and all of it seems very commonplace and normal. We might feel less indifferent though if we considered how altered our world would be if some of the astronomical factors were changed even slightly. Suppose that with everything else being the same the Earth had started out with twice its present mass giving a surface gravity 1.38 times Earth normal. Would the progression of animal life from sea to land have been as rapid as it was? While the evolution of marine life would not have differed greatly landforms would have to be more sturdily constructed with a lower center of mass. Trees would tend to be shorter and to have strongly buttressed trunks. Land animals would tend to develop heavier leg bones and sturdier musculatures. The development of flying forms would certainly have been different to conform with the denser air, which would produce more aerodynamic drag at a given velocity, and the higher gravity, which would require more lifting surface to support a given mass. A number of opposing forces would have changed the face of the land. Mountain forming activity might be increased but mountains could not thrust so high and still have the structural strength to support their own weight. In addition raindrop and stream erosion would be magnified so that the mountains would wear down more rapidly. The steeper density gradient in the atmosphere would change the weather patterns, wave heights in the oceans would be lower and the reach of ocean spray would be shortened resulting in less evaporation and a drier atmosphere. Cloud decks would tend to be lower and the land sea ratio would probably be small because the average continental height would be lower and more water would be produced by volcanic action. The length of the month would shorten by about 4 days if the moon's distance remained the same. There would be differences in the earth's magnetic field the thickness of its crust the size of its core the distribution of mineral deposits in the crust the level of radioactivity in the rocks and the size of the ice caps on islands in the polar regions. Conversely suppose that the Earth had started out with half its present mass resulting in a surface gravity 0.73 times Earth normal. Again the course of evolution and geological history would have changed under the influences of the lower gravity the thinner atmosphere the reduced erosion by falling water and the probably increased level of background radiation due to more crustal radioactivity and solar cosmic particles. Would evolution have proceeded more rapidly? Would the progression from sea to land and the entry of animal forms into the ecological niches open to airborne species have occurred earlier? Undoubtedly animal skeletons would be lighter and trees would be generally taller and more spindly. What if the inclination of the Earth's equator initially had been 60 degrees instead of 23.5 degrees? Seasonal weather changes would then be all but intolerable and the only climatic region suitable for life as we know it would be in a narrow belt within about 5 degrees of the equator. With such a narrow habitable range it is probable that life would have had difficulty getting started and once started would have evolved but slowly. Starting out with an equatorial inclination of 0 degrees would have influenced the course of development of the Earth's life forms in only a minor way. Seasons would be an unknown phenomenon weather would undoubtedly be far more predictable and constant from day to day. The temperate zones would enjoy a constant spring. However the region within 12 degrees of the equator would become too hot for habitability, at least near sea level, though in partial compensation some regions closer to the poles would become more habitable than they are now. But what about mental and emotional development? In the absence of seasons would the environment be less stimulating and would a diminution of environmental pressures have led to less rapid evolution of the human brain? And if that were not so how would the lack of the existence of alternations of a growing season and a non-growing season a cycle of life and death and rebirth have altered man's religious development? Suppose the Earth's mean distance from the Sun were 10% less than it is at present. Less than 20% of the surface area would then be habitable. 
there would be two narrow regions favorable to life between latitudes 45 degrees and 65 degrees north and south separated by a wide and intolerably hot barrier. Land life could evolve independently in these two regions. The polar ice would not be present so the ocean level would be higher than it is now thus decreasing the land area. If the earth were 10% farther away from the sun the ice caps would grow lowering the sea level. The habitable regions would be those within 47 degrees of the equator so that Canada Great Britain Scandinavia and the Soviet Union would be frozen out. If the Earth's rotation rate were increased so as to make the day 3 hours long instead of the usual 24 the oblateness would be pronounced and changes of gravity with changes of latitude would be a common part of a traveler's experience. Day to night temperature differences would become small and it is difficult to predict what sleeping habits we might have developed or failed to develop. On the other hand if the Earth's rotation rate were slowed down to make the day 100 hours in length day to night temperature changes would be extreme and weather cycles would have a more pronounced day fitting pattern. The sun's movement across the sky would be almost imperceptible and few life forms on land could tolerate either the heat of the long day or the cold of the long night. The effects of reducing the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit to zero from its present value of 0.0167 or increasing it to 0.2 without altering the length of the major axis of the ellipse would have little effect on the planet. Increasing the mass of the Sun by 20% and moving the Earth's orbit out to 1.408 AU, 130 million miles, to keep the illuminance at the present level would increase the period of revolution to 1.54 years, 563 days, and decrease the sun's apparent angular diameter from the 32 minutes of arc as it is now to 26 minutes of arc. Since a more massive star is a hotter star the sun would not have to exhibit as much apparent surface to give us our necessary illuminance. The sun would under these conditions be a class F5 star with a total main sequence lifetime of about 5.4 billion years. If the age of the solar system is taken as 4.5 billion years then the Earth under these conditions could look forward to another billion years, possibly less, of history rather than the 5 to 7 billion to which it can look forward now. An F5 star may well be more active than our Sun thus producing a higher exosphere temperature in the planetary atmosphere, but this subject is so little understood at present that no conclusions can be drawn. Presumably apart from the longer year the smaller apparent size of the sun its more pronounced whiteness and the imminence of doom life could be much the same. If the mass of the sun were reduced by 20%, this time decreasing the Earth's orbital dimensions to compensate, the new orbital distance would be 0.654 AU, about 60 million miles. The year's length would then become 0.59 years, 215 days, and the sun would look much larger with an apparent angular diameter of 41 minutes of arc. The primary would be of spectral type G8, slightly yellower than our sun is now, with a main sequence lifetime in excess of 20 billion years. The ocean tides due to the sun would be about equal to those due to the moon so that the rotation rate would have slowed down more than it has and the day would be more than 24 hours long. What if the moon had been located much closer to the earth than it is say about 95,000 miles away instead of 239,000 miles? The tidal breaking force by now would probably have been sufficient to halt the rotation of the earth with respect to the moon and the earth's day would equal its month and become 166 hours, 6.924 hour days, in length with respect to the sun. Consequently the Earth would have great extremes of temperature and would be non-habitable. Increasing the mass of the Moon to 10 times the present value would have the same effect even though it were left at its present distance. The day-month would then be equal to 26-24 hour periods. Moving the Moon farther away than it is would have much less profound results, the month would merely be longer and the tides lower. Decreasing the Moon's mass at its present distance would affect only the tides. What if the properties of some of the other planets of the solar system were changed? Suppose the mass of Jupiter were increased 1050 times making it essentially a replica of the Sun. The Earth could still occupy its present orbit around the Sun but its sky would be enriched by the presence of an extremely bright star of magnitude minus 23.7 which would supply up to 6% as much heat and light as the Sun. Mercury and Venus could also keep their present orbits though Mars and Saturn could not. 
Uranus, Neptune and Pluto might have modified orbits revolving about the center of mass of the two stars rather than about one star alone. All in all the Earth is a wonderful planet to live on just the way it is. Almost any change in its physical properties position or orientation would be for the worse from our human-centered viewpoint. We are not likely to find a planet that suits us better although at some future time there may be men who prefer to live on other planets. And at the present time since the Earth is as yet the only home we have we would do well to conserve its treasures and to use its resources intelligently. Space Flight and Human Destiny In the next few centuries man will be living on the Earth under conditions of increasing discomfort. The population of the Earth is growing at a rate between 1.5 and 2 percent per year. It cannot continue to do so indefinitely and an upper limit must be reached somehow within the next several hundred years, hopefully by some means other than a man-made catastrophe. The final stabilized population will be considerably higher than today's population and the Earth will be much more crowded than it is now. The incentives for pioneers to seek new lives among the stars for themselves and their families will increase continually, and eventually the number of human beings living elsewhere than on Earth may exceed, even far exceed, the population of the home planet. But space flight will not have the effect of reducing our population. This is obvious of course from the present rate of increase in the world's population. In mid-1962 the world's population was estimated to have reached the 3 billion mark and the net annual rate of increase was estimated at 1.8% or over 50 million people per year. Just to hold the Earth's population constant at the present time would require the emigration of almost 150,000 people per day. Clearly not a reasonable concept. In another century if the present rate of natural increase continues the emigration rate would have to be stepped up to 900,000 per day to keep the Earth's population constant at 18 billion people. It is not the reduction of Earth's population that will make space flight the most significant development in the history of civilized mankind then. Instead it will be the gradual multiplication of human beings living on planets other than the Earth. Over the generations man may leave Earth in considerable numbers and penetrate the galaxy to considerable depth. If man learns to travel through space at say one quarter or one half the speed of light then even with long planetary stopovers on his star hopping expedition stopovers long enough to reduce his net advance to only one tenth the speed of light the entire galaxy could be explored and all its habitable planets settled within the next million years. Unquestionably many technological advances will occur before so many years have passed and the spread of mankind throughout the galaxy may take place even more rapidly. And the significance. We have already spoken of the hastened physical evolution of men who colonize planets not exactly like the Earth in physical properties. There may however be another form of evolution more subtle in its nature and more profound in its effects in the very nature of space flight. Each stage in the progress of man as he star hops into new unexplored regions of the galaxy will be accompanied by an important kind of distillation process. Always those volunteering for the next expedition into the unknown will tend to be adventurous self-reliant inquisitive courageous and hardy pioneers while those selected to go will be chosen on the basis of good health high professional competence emotional stability reliability of judgment and so on. In the main these characteristics will be passed on to their descendants so that a kind of selection process will take place with those at the frontier of the wave through the galaxy always representing some of the best qualities of mankind and leavening all of mankind with those qualities. Space flight in short may well represent a new form of evolutionary pressure both with respect to the new environments to which man will be exposed and to the new requirements made of his mind and character a pressure more strenuous than any ever known on earth. Its results we scarcely dare imagine and we regret we cannot live to see them.